So I'd like to call this meeting of the South Burlington School Board to order. Um, we'll start as we have the last few meetings just by reviewing uh, how to participate. Um, uh, attendees may submit questions either in writing through the Q&A tab um, or they may use the raise hand function. If you uh, submit a question in writing or a comment, um, I will read it um, and direct it to someone to answer or respond to it. Uh, if you still have follow-up, it would be great if you could raise your hand um, and use that feature uh, if you have a follow-up question. Um, and as uh, for those of you who have not participated in board meetings before um, or attended them, uh, typically for each agenda item, there's a presentation or some kind of discussion from the administration uh, to the board. Um, the board has a chance to ask its questions and make comments, and then we open it up for public questions and comments uh, after that for each agenda item. So with that, um, I will move on to agenda item number three, comments from the public regarding items not on the agenda. I am just looking to see if we have any raised hands. I see no Q&A, written questions, and no raised hands. So I'll assume there are no uh, questions regarding items not on the agenda. We'll move on to uh, agenda item number four, amendments to the agenda. I have none, Bridget. Any other board members? No. OK. Then we will move on quickly to agenda item number five, announcement student re representative report. Yes, and so we have we have Delaney. I don't know that we have Cole on yet. Yes, Cole is on. Or he was. Awesome. Yep, there he is. <laughs> well, there they are. Awesome. Well, good to see you guys. And um, you got you got the floor, Cole and Delaney. So Cole, go ahead. Awesome. Um, we don't have much. We only have about three things, so it'll be quick. Um, the main thing that I'm going to be talking about is grading changes at the high school have changed. So um, there is now a pass fail option for students who don't receive a grade, for, for students who receive a grade higher than a fail, they have the option to mark that as, mark that course, the second semester course as a pass. Um, the semester one grades have been kept, so that way those will be staying safe. Um, and then students who get a B or an A have the option to keep those grades. Even students with a C or a D, if they choose, can keep those grades. Um, and basically, the pass won't be affecting the GPAs. And so that has been the biggest thing that came out for um, supporting the students from the high school. And then Delaney has the other two. Cool. Yeah, um, so my first announcement is basically just that um, the that we have just ended break and school started Monday the 27th. And my second announcement is that South Burlington High School will be holding a remote coffee house and open mic through the platform Zoom. This will take place on Friday, May 1st at 5 p.m. and will include slam poets, dancers, performance artists, and, mus and musicians from SBHS. Uh, if you have any questions or would like to join the audience, Email Thompson S at sbschool.net. Thank you. All our announcements. Thank you very much. Any other announcements? Nope. There's a lot of things going on, uh, you know, um, as there always is, even when we're all present. But I think under these kind of uh, uncertain times, there's there's just a lot of great things going on that we don't see happening in in our in our schools, but we certainly know they're happening and have received many, many uh, positives from community members uh, of art teachers doing some different things um, um, on their front lawns to connect with students, to um, teachers sharing some special stories and making all kinds of connections. And again, I think we're, um, we're doing the very best we can, although we miss the students a lot. Thanks, Bridget. All right, thank you for that. Um, with that, we'll move on to agenda item number six, city and school collaboration. So we haven't had another meeting. I don't know, Elizabeth, did, did we last report out um, on our last meeting? I cannot recall. I didn't mark that one from the last time we communicated. Uh, 
Elizabeth, can you unmute yourself? Yeah, sorry, I thought I had. Um, mm -hmm. I believe we did report out on the last right. um, leadership meeting and uh, the biggest updates, I think, um, I see Donna Kinvill on, but the biggest updates were uh, related to um, the timing and the logistics of having a budget vote. We do okay. have those scheduled out. We have another one coming up uh, next month, but um, thank you, Elizabeth. Okay, we'll move on to agenda item number seven, superintendent's report. So Gary's on, I'm gonna call on him here in just a second. We've got um, four bullet items here. Uh, Rick Marcotte Central School or 180 Market Street. Um, the Chamberlain noise um, situation, we wanna just give a quick update, COVID-19, which probably everybody has as much information as we do at this point, but just kind of how we are uh, working through it. So um, as you know, um, there's been a real slowdown in any anything that any uh, workers can do on the properties. That's recently opened up a little bit. Gary's going to give you a little update on where we are with with 180 Market. Gary, are you are you on and able to? I, I am. Can you Great. hear me? Okay. Okay. okay so uh, happy to report that construction um, has started again at 180 Market Street. Started this week again. Um, there are limitations of five workers um, on the work site at any time. Um, however, um, we have divided that work site or Engelbert has divided that work site into two sites. They got approval to do that. So site one is the existing um, 180 Market Street project that the city is undertaking. And then site two now is the east parking lot at Rick Marcotte. Um, so the eastern parking lot is now completely fenced off. Um, the playground is completely segregated from the work area on the east side um, and the north side. It's pretty much fully, fully enclosed. So what we're, what we're attempting to do, what Engelbert and, and the school are attempting to do is, is get the stormwater on the east side of the structure done, on the east side of the project done as soon as possible. Um, to buy us some time to make sure that we can complete the entire project by the projected school start date uh, for the 2021 school year. So that's that's a positive. Um, I, I was over there yesterday afternoon. They were they were going full out. Um, they had already had some of the stormwater structure put in uh, on that east side. Um, next to the playing field that they had started prior to the COVID-19 shutdown. So we're hopeful that we will be on schedule and, and without major impact uh, in the fall, um, even though the 180 Market Street project is, is probably delayed some. Thanks, Kerry. Next is the um, update on, uh, I don't know if board members had any questions related to that. Um, we are, again, as Gary said, trying to take advantage of this particular uncertain times to try to get some things moving along. And so we're happy that we have the opportunity to get people back on that site so it doesn't stall for too long of a period, creating concerns about uh, when we are able to function more normally. Uh, the next is the Chamberlain School Noise Mitigation, just giving you an update. Again, it's been fairly quiet. We've, we've been more recently pushed in Gary as asked for some clarification through LNN, which is the construction, and through um, Jones Paines, uh, as we were trying to make sure that we stay in the queue for the grant. But I'll let Gary uh, give you a little more of an update than I. Yeah, there's there's good news on that front as well. I've um, been in contact with Nick and Jones Payne over the last um, week. Um, they have a, Nick feels, BTV feels, they have a clear path to making the, the this round of FAA grant submission deadlines. Um, I don't have the exact date, uh, but the airport does. And so they have hired another company out of Boston, Jones Payne has to complete a full uh, cost estimate by mid-May is their target date to have a full cost estimate of the system that we, we advise that, that we would prefer um, to have put into the Chamberlain School. Um, C3 is the company out of Boston that has been retained to complete that. They're, they've got LN, LN's information um, and they're 
projected to have that full cost estimate done, which is a key component to the grant application uh, by mid-May. So it seems like after the, you know, the airport, the BTV folks were done, were a little bit of the pressure came off. They really put this on the front burner and, and Nick's been, been very proactive right now. And Jones Payne came back last week with a couple of questions that I answered. Um, and it looks like everything's progressing pretty well right now. Thanks, Gary. And at some point we do know that, again, we've got to pull Holly back into the into the queue in the Chamberlain community, but we're still trying to figure out gaining additional clarity before we can do a lot of additional communicating at this point. But um, the other thing- I believe thing Elizabeth have... has a question. Yeah, I, I had a question, David or Gary. Where, where do things stand on the matching funding issue? You're muted, Gary. Gary, you're muted. Gary, you're muted. Can you unmute? <laughs> yes, I hope that was clear. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I really, I really don't have a, a full uh, handle on where the match is going to come from. I know that you know our our last discussions um, with the airport that David and I had a meeting with Nick and Jean. You know there was commitment to collaborate on on finding that money and, and I know it's a concern but but it doesn't seem to be stopping the process that that they're trying to push through with the FAA so again remember remember that, remember that Gary uh, did meet with I forget the utility companies Gary no Vermont gas was one of them and there was some offsets there and uh, sure. I think that that may be um, enough of um, some movement I, I think by the by the utilities and the support to to support moving forward. Um, I don't know. We're going to have to ask some more additional clarifying questions at some point on that. But so far, there's good news around moving that moving moving forward. Anyway, we the other thing we have in the queue, of course, is the the testing. Remember, we were going to do our own independent kind of another benchmark with the with the sound related matters uh, of the. F 35 data similar to what we did with the F-16 data. And we, we really haven't, because of the COVID-19, we really, quite honestly, just haven't haven't put that back on the schedule, um, haven't put that forward as a de definitive plan at this point, but we still need to figure that out. The plan was just to do it in the month of May, similar to what we did with, uh, with the F-16. And Gary did do all of the setup and has that queued up and ready. He and I just haven't spent a lot of time on that particular topic yeah Again. yeah david just to add i i did we just got an email from atc um and today they're authorized to go back to work we don't have a date of when they can do that work they're barely backlogged at this point but it was good news that they were authorized to go back and start work again today great thanks gary i don't know other any other questions uh bridget from other yeah. board members or anything yeah if i could just clarify at one point the um even the application for the grant was contingent on the school acknowledging um, responsibility for that 10% match, I believe. So it sounds like we've never had to um, commit to that component of a match and it's still going forward. I guess I really, at some point, I think we need to be explicit that we are not committing to that match. It sounds like there's some opportunities to collaborate on how that match may be funded. Um, but I, I don't wanna put the district in a position where we um, inadvertently have committed to the match and, and hold that bag as it were, if this contingency um, funding doesn't become available or this collaborative funding doesn't become available. Yeah, I think you're definitely on point, um, Elizabeth. One of the things that, again, Gary and I were pretty clear about is, you know, 10% of what? There was many different options out there. And so that was in part why we were asking for clarification around the option. Um, we were given some idea, some questions like, what options would you like? And we didn't, again, feel like we were qualified to be able to be making those decisions, mm -hmm. particularly without cost specific information. Um, so I think as a result, we've, we've you know, Gary has pushed uh, to the next step and I, we still may be, in that situation. And we're certainly gonna to wanna to make sure that we do have that clarified. Thank you. 
So good to move on. I think we're okay to move on. Yes, yeah. to COVID-19 update. Yeah. So COVID-19, um, again, as I said earlier, it's likely people who've been listening to the governor's press conference and the health commissioner um, probably have just as much, if not more, because I have not been on, we've been on Zoom meetings uh, a good chunk of the time when those have been on. But nonetheless, you know, we've, we've been following through with, um, I think all of the administrators have certainly been receiving different, you know, different information from different sources, information from different sources, similar and consistent. But um, right now we're continuing in the con continuity of learning plans uh, and administrators, uh, teachers, staff, uh, transportation and nutrition services, security people are all, you know, working diligently hard. Our IT people uh, making things happen. Um, we've been really trying to be mindful about making sure as we move to this next phase that we have uh, continuity for uh, people accessing uh, the internet and having devices in their hands. And I think we're, we're pretty proud of where we are. We, we still aren't 100%, but we're working towards that. Um, and so, um, again, at this point, um, Patrick has been involved a little bit more recently. We've had some conversation around uh, graduation, celebration, nothing yet is definitive. Uh, Patrick has actually assisted me with a, filling out a survey um, related to what we're looking at related to graduation, but it's not only graduation. Obviously that's the major culminating event in our district, but also we've got eighth grade celebration, we've got fifth grade celebrations, et cetera, that we wanna be able to be mindful. And today at our administrative meeting at 11, that was a conversation that was also had. We wanna make sure that those are, however they're done, they're done in a way that's has the, the, the right level of celebration, um, however we are able to do it. So um, again, um, I don't know if there's there's a lot going on, of course, uh, we're soon to hear more about, you know, whether or not, uh, we know that at this point schools closed um, until further notice. I think the governor has been pretty clear about that. The VPA has kind of held out um, a, a, a later date, uh, I think next week of making a decision on sports. But again, if, if uh, schools aren't open, sports aren't going. And so that's that was a, a set date. Um, but at this point, you know, um, we're trying to, you know, just make sure that uh, we're meeting students' needs. We're checking in with them regularly, obviously, yeah. and doing the things again. I don't know if you have any specific question around anything related to where we are, board members. Do Do we know, David, the um, any specifics on the um, the CARES funding that has come at a federal level and how that's being applied to the Ed Fund um, to to public education in general? Yeah, so there's about 1.2 billion dollars that have come into the state, and we know that of CARES money. Um, of that money, I do not exactly know how that breakout is. We have heard different numbers associated with the. Uh, shortfall in the Ed Fund, anywhere from 89 up to 200 plus. Um, it's unclear to me on those figures whether or not they have counted in any of the CARES money, and I think the CARES money is somewhere in the, the 20 million or so. But it's unclear to me on, on where that is. I don't know, again, if Gary or Amity are on, if they know either at this point. We have not received a lot that I know of, but Gary or Amity, feel free to step in if you know more than I do. Um, from some of the information we've been receiving through um, the Agency of Education, it was initially thought that our that the district's portion of that money would be a percentage, I believe it was 80, of our Title I allotment, but that hasn't been finalized. And the last I knew, the agency was working with the feds about uh, the possibility of being able to put that money into the education fund rather than strictly having to disseminate it to districts directly. So there's still work being done um, at the agency level. Thanks, how, many, how much is our Title I funding? Um, our Title I funding was in the 500,000. So 80% of that is what we think. And again, that was speculation as to what that amount of money might be, but that's what it's looking like. 
So we'll keep you posted on that. I mean, there's a lot of things going on, that, and not to get too deep, but between the Senate and the Senate and House Education, there's been some bills that have been proposed. Uh, Bridget and I actually testified last week, Friday, Friday, um, on some components of the House Ed Bill, which would be revert back to the previous year budget 100% um, and allow um, the voters to continue to vote until June 30th. Um, and some provisions in there that if you are unable to get passage that it would allow the school board to uh, enter into a, an agreement. Um, but again, that's the house one and I have not heard as of today what kind of actions have taken place. I know the Senate initially had a uh, the previous year budget <clears throat> plus an inflator. And I don't think that that has um, continued to live on. And so I don't really have a, a more recent update than, than that at this time. So anyway, that's the that's the update on COVID. Um, again, I don't know other questions from the board. Um, there have been community members asking what is in the works, if anything. I know you said there were no decisions made about graduation or celebrations, but are there any things that are being considered? So I don't, I think Patrick's on actually, um, uh, Pat, if you're on, um, yeah. again, he and I, he actually mostly took the survey. He and I were collaborating a bit on the phone while he completed the survey, but he provided some good, good feedback. Um, so Patrick, if you're able to give some of the options that you were, that you are thinking. Sure. I mean, I think, I think the important, uh, thing at this point is to, and what I really wanted to make sure that the agency of education was aware of is that, you know, um, despite the fact that graduation is, you know, typically a, um, a, is an event that takes a lot of planning that we have the, the commitment, wherewithal and capacity to, to pivot, you know, and to be nimble relative to what, uh, whatever the social gathering expectations are. So, um, so there has been some quiet planning right now, just starting in the background about the potential for us to um, uh, to not be able to have an in-person ceremony uh, on June 12th, which is um, our uh, scheduled graduation ceremony. I did have a meeting with the um, senior class parents um, uh, just before break, the Friday before break, or maybe the Thursday before break. And um, I surveyed the parent cohort about uh, timing of a potential delayed graduation if um, if we start to hear some uh, rumblings that uh, there might be continued uh, a loosening of the spigot, as the governor says. And so we're really holding out hope for, um, for some kind of in-person event for our seniors, but also we're planning uh, uh, multiple contingencies that would include everything from multiple small graduations uh, to uh, digital virtual graduations, you know, really everything remains on the table. Of the almost 200 parents who attended the senior class meeting on Zoom, um, you know, we had over 80 parents uh, step forward saying that they would be willing to, um, to volunteer or to assist in any way to uh, make sure that we were able to do uh, excuse me, something for, uh, for our seniors. And, you know, I think that kind of speaks to the, to the, to the, the will of the community and, uh, and the school and the parents to, to make something happen for the class of 2020. And so, um, I'm scheduling another class meeting with the seniors, um, this week, uh, at noon on Friday. So like if anybody's watching Cole, now, you know, <laughs> um, good. The rest of the seniors who are watching the school board meeting right now also know, but um, and that's where we're going to launch a uh, a survey of the students because we feel like getting uh, students' opinions on things like virtual versus delayed, in person versus um, versus virtual or remote. I think those are going to be some really important uh, data points for us in, as we start to make these decisions. So. Uh, you know, we're committed. And, and as I said to begin with, you know, I, and I told this to the to Secretary French, you know, he was like, well, when, what date do you need to know by? And I'm, I'm, you know, June, you know, tell us in June that we can do something and we'll do it, you know, and, uh, and we would really like to hold out uh, 
to continue to hold out hope while also, you know, planning for uh, contingencies. Thank you, Patrick. And, and Patrick also gave some good feedback. Uh, obviously, you know, we're a larger, one of the larger high schools, but you know, uh, one size doesn't all fit all, fit all either. And so as you look at smaller, you know, um, high schools with, you know, very few kids, you know, it shouldn't be that one size is, or one decision makes it for everyone. So looking at different options um, is probably, or giving that level of flexibility, depending on what the guidance is, is gonna be important, so. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you. Um, David, is there, are we, have we covered end of school year or is there another bullet point about end no, of school I think, year? I think that's, the, I think we're good. Um, that was really kind of, kind of wind, wind in exactly, kind of culminating experiences. I talked briefly um, about, you know, the fifth grade, you know, celebration, the eighth grade celebration. And again, uh, Patrick highlighted what he highlighted, I think is not uh, dissimilar than what we're thinking about for for the other students as well. Obviously, uh, not the same, not the same exact ceremony. And obviously, we make the high school graduation kind of our culminating one. Um, and those uh, either eighth or fifth grade are, are ones that are, you know, important, but not not necessarily the same the same the same manner. So we're working on that. Uh, the, the hard part is again the hats off to the administrators. You can't really just put all your eggs in one basket and say we're going this way. You kind of got to say we know we're going. We got to get to the end, but we don't really know. We don't know a lot, so we have, in some cases, three, four, five options that we got to plan out. And then we got the operation side behind it, uh, and Gary and his crew to figure out. Okay, if we are going to do graduation and chairs, then you know we got a whole whole another layer of activation. So, a lot of effort has gone into these option plans that are um, that are out there in, in many fronts. So, that's off to them. Thanks, Bridget. Good. Thank you. Any other board members with questions about the superintendent's report? We do have one community hand raised, but I wanted to make sure there were no other board questions before we went there. Okay. Um, Annie Loop uh, has her hand raised. And now she's muted. She wasn't muted, but now she is. Um, can we make sure that she's unmuted if she wanted to ask something? I, I just put my hand up for the next uh, agenda music meeting. I'm sorry. I took that. Oh, okay. No worries. No worries. Very okay. Sorry. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so we will then move on to agenda item number eight. Consider the FY 2021 school district budget. And this is Warren for action for tonight. Okay. Bridget? Yes. Um, can I make a recommendation because um, Donna is on, and I guess I defer to David and you on this, is I wonder if we should look at the um, uh, the issues of holding the vote. Um, I don't know if we we talk about the warning for May 28th, but um, uh, David and I sat in on the um, Board of um, Civil Authority on Monday. So I wonder if we shouldn't have that conversation and um, then maybe Donna could drop off if she needs to. I'm okay with that, David, if you're okay with that, or essentially doing part of number item number nine under item number eight, but I'm I'm okay with that if everyone else is. Yeah, okay. I think it's fine. Let's go for it then. So David, are you talking about that or Elizabeth? Did no, you so we understand? have we do have Donna on and I think that it's great. I did invite her and she's a panelist because I did expect that there may be some questions that come up from from the public and or from the board around how we're or how the the um, Board of Civil Authorities is is proposing to run uh, the May uh, vote. And so um, as Bridge, as Elizabeth said, we sat in on that meeting and really just listened. They answered a couple of quick questions on behalf of the, the school district, but I think 15 or so of the the um, the um, Board of Civil Authorities was online and they had you know pretty active discussion about how we would do this or how they would do it during this. So um, I, I maybe just ask if Donna's on, she can just give an overview of what the plan is um, um, so that people can have better clarity around how how the, the plan, what the plan is. Donna, are you still on? I am. Um, the Board of Civil Authority met um, to discuss how to move forward. It's the first time the board, um, just for people out there who aren't sure the Board of Civil Authority are, they're all the elected officials in the city, excluding the school board. Um, so it's the city council, it's all the justices of the peace, and it's myself as well as city clerk. Um, and one of our duties is to run the elections. 
And since we had this whole COVID-19 outbreak happen, we hadn't had the opportunity to sit down as a board and discuss how we thought we wanted to move forward or, or, or even what the, the scene is gonna be like, you know, on May 28th, that is the date. Uh, so it was kind of a very interesting conversation. Um, it ranged from everything we discussed, um, holding the election as normal. Uh, we discussed the fact that the state um, at that point had a directive out there that the governor or secretary of state's office could bypass local charters and state law and allow the elections to be held <clears throat> either as a drive up kind of election. So still have early voting, still have all that happen. But instead of the polling areas being open, um, we would set up a location or two or three um, where people could go up and actually check in in their car, drive to another location in the parking lot, <coughs> excuse me, uh, vote their ballot, drive up to another station, deposit their ballot into something and then leave. Um, and so there was some discussion on that. And then there was a discussion on mailing a ballot out to everybody who is on the voter checklist. Um, and therefore the polling hours on election day would be just be like two or three hours for those people who need to register to vote or those people who never received their ballot. Um, we would still have to do that. So that's kind of the discussion where it went. Um, and I was a bit surprised um, by a vote of 11 to four. And actually there were 16 of us there because I, I decided not to vote. Um, but 11 to four vote was to hold it um, as close to normal as possible. <clears throat> they thought that the comfort level, my assumption is I think the board's comfort level with running the election the way we always run the election helps. Um, and also the fact that the public's comfort level in voting the same way um, was also there. So we do have the ability and I do have some M95 masks coming, they'll be in next week. We have gloves, we have sanitizers, we're going to put a plexiglass in front of the check-in and in certain spaces and um, modify uh, the direction. You go in the, in the gym one area and go out a different door so there's no crossing of people. Um, marking six feet apart, um, having someone at the door because we can't have more than 10 people in the polling area, including um, the workers at this point. Um, so keep an eye on how many are there, one's in, someone else move in, someone leaves, and just kind of keep that flow going. Uh, so uh, they decided to hold it as normal. Um, so that is kind of where the board left it at. And one of the other uh, things that I heard, Adana, was to get out as much information about absentee ballot. I think I heard, you know, from your group that there was going to be, you know, you know, uh, diligence around getting things in the other paper to make sure that a notice would right. be in the other paper for absentee ballot. And I think you said about 18% uh, of the voters had absentee ballots last time. Was that correct? No, oh, is that right? More than that. Uh, it was yeah. more than that because it was the presidential primary. So we probably have right now in the office uh, probably about 1,100 of them ready to go. We've got them all stuffed except for the ballot, um, ready to go and addressed and everything. Um, the problem we're having over at the clerk's office is that city staff is on furlough. So basically it is me working um, and I get to call in one of my staff for a couple hours a day. That is it. Uh, so as soon as this does kick up, um, it is gonna be the conversation of how do we move forward. And we're right now in violation. We can only have one person in my office and one researcher, that is it. We cannot have anybody else in the office. So it's gonna be very hard for us to conduct this election um, so I am going to be writing a letter to the governor asking for um, elections to be considered an essential service uh, and therefore bypass some of the rules and restrictions he has on, on the front end of it because we, like David said, the board does want to heavily advertise early voting. Um, not in, we're not open to the public yet, so it'll all be through the mail um, at this point. Uh, so we are looking to get that out as much as we can. But then on the other end, I got to have the staff to process these. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. So we're trying to figure out how we can work through all of this, but definitely trying to um, push the absentee and knowing that some people are going to come to the polls because that's what they always do. And they, they want to do it that way. And we will be there for them. 
The, the last thing uh, that I heard you share, um, you provided some ideas of mapping of how people might come into the school, Donna, for instance, yeah. the, the middle school, having a longer walkway in, uh, yeah. um, being able to socially distance and not be out in the rain, et cetera. Um, and again, that would be at the, the Tuttle School, that would be at Chamberlain and Orchard would be the three locations currently that we use. And, and with this new, to, correct, and we did that, and we, depending on the three polling locations we have, we'll have step, different setups for each. And um, what we, I, what I envision is having only one check-in person uh, with a checklist for the whole district because they're not going to be allowed a crowd of people lined up for them. One person standing outside, making sure we only have ten people in at one time. Two workers for the board of civil authority, and just having the flow and things marked off, signage saying social distancing, then actually have them go out a separate side door. So um, it's just this one nice little flow goes through. People go out a different door, um, and trying to keep everybody as distant as possible. Um, in fact, I even heard um, talking to Will Senning in the Secretary of State's office today. Um, they are actually going to look into even providing us with the face shields as well. Um, so there's there's going to be a lot of attention on this election um, and how it goes for the first, I think, municipality in the state that's going to be holding their election in, after this COVID um, declaration was done. So I think there's going to be a lot of eyes on us to see how we did it and what the outcome is going to be. Thanks, Donna. Lessons learned. Yep. Thank you. One question I had is whether there's been thought given to signage or some process um, specific to uh, folks with physical challenges. Um, this seems to come up on election day, um, just because I think a lot of people aren't comfortable using the bus lane normally um, to drop off folks who want to vote or to get closer to the school. And I don't know in this instance what we can do for folks. Um, I'm just concerned if we have folks going out a side door that is, you know, onto the grass or, you know, some other direction. Um, I just, I'm sure you've probably thought of it, but I just wanted to raise it uh, to make sure that um, ideally, obviously, those folks would have absentee ballots and not have to deal with standing in line and all of that. But I just wanted to make sure that we were thinking through that um, because we get some complaints on election day. <laughs> um, well, unfortunately, um, we are limited to the number of people we can have. And because of the fact that we're still in this pandemic, um, I did have the board all committed uh, to, well, at least 11 people who voted for this, um, all committed to working. Um, I have not got a chance to talk to our other um, election workers, um, who most of them are um, of the age that we have to worry about. Um, so for us to be able to offer to be able to go out to the curbside service and if someone wanted to pull up in their car and do it we wouldn't be we wouldn't be staffed to do so because then we'd have to have our two bca workers leave which left polls really unattended by election workers um so yeah it's, it's kind of what we've always done um it's really no different than any other election that we have um so if anybody is out there listening and you have issues please call me um, at the clerk's office and we can discuss and try to figure out ways to make this work. Um, but right now, we're just kind of going to work on things as we've always worked on things. And Donna, um, this is Elizabeth. Um, I recall something in the um, Secretary of State's communication that also indicated, depending on uh, if, if, you know, something were to happen that there hasn't been this, you know, increased um, uh, access or something would change. Is there a seven day window that the location locations or location could change? Right. Is that accurate? That is accurate. There is a special provision um, and it has to do because it's a revote and it has to do because of the emergency declaration that um, so this is what the board has voted on how they would like to proceed with the election. Um, up to seven days prior to the vote um we can post a new warning just advertising the location of the vote or how it's going to be voting is going to be different so if it ends up being that this thing's we get another spike and it's getting worse um obviously it's too late and, and it's probably about a forty thousand dollar price tag on the city and school to do a mail-in ballot to everybody so it's, it's a very expensive option um but say the board decided if, uh, the board decided or you guys decided that hey you know let's Let's go still the drive through. At least everybody's in the car. You got some distance. 
we have up until seven days prior to the vote to change how we're voting the locations and how we're doing it. We can't go strictly to all mail and ballot because that would just be too late. But we could change how we actually process election day. Thank you. Thank you for that. Are there any other board questions for Donna? Uh, it's Brian here. I guess there's one more, which is that whenever I've gone to the polls, the people volunteering seem to be seniors or retirees. Is there any concern? Well, obviously there is for their health, but is there any concern about staffing also that they may not wish to volunteer this time, given the nature of the disease? I I'm wondering if Donna feels like she's going to be staffed enough at the polls. That's a good question. We don't know yet because we really had, don't have a definitive answer yet for a date. So we haven't really been able to go out and approach our other workers to see um, how they feel about it yet. So we haven't taken that step yet because this was the third time we were to gone out to these people and asked them if they wanted to vote. Uh, so we thought it was best to kind of hold back and wait uh, until we know we have an exact date and then we'll go out. We've heard from a couple of them that said they don't want to vote or they don't want to work. And we've had a couple of people say, why haven't you called me yet? So, um, I think we'll squeak through. Um, if not, then we can call on some other people as well um, and see if we can get some more workers. Yeah, when we when we um, uh, when Donna held the meeting again, as as we said earlier, I was on, and um, so was Elizabeth. But I did share with them, you know, it was likely that the the, the board would be taking action on a May twenty eighth day. So it was it was shared, um, but yet as Donna said, it has not yet been definitive. So um, that's obviously an important step of, of where we are tonight on item nine um, on, on board action. Okay. I think it's a bit tricky for us to actually take action on the meeting Dates, no, you can't. Uh, you, you can't do that now. Um, again, because we have to wait until we've actually decided on a number correct. so that we can yeah. uh, approve the the um, the warning. Yeah, um, I think so. I think we need to flip back to item number eight to yeah, discuss so the budget. Just to be clear, I, what Donna provided was information specific to items eight and nine yeah. around voting processes. You know, so I think she kind of gave an overview of, you know, what what would be done if the board so chooses on items eight and nine. So um, you're absolutely right. So let's move back to item eight if you're if you're good um, or move on to item eight, I guess, yeah. uh, Bridget, if you're good with that. I'm good so, with that. <clears throat> I, I do have Amity on and, and Gary and have a lot of the administrators again, long day for them as well. Um, again, my praise goes out to all of them. I know teachers across the district, as I said earlier in announcements have just been you know, doing a great job and I'm really proud of the work that's been happening and I would be remiss if I didn't say that and that ripples through the entire organization to the people that are in my office also, you know, around just trying to make make these types of meetings happen like the lineup. So um, we want to walk you through the, the budget. Um, again, uh, we're going to do this fairly quickly and allow the board then to have the deliberative deliberate conversation that you wish. Uh, this budget has not changed from the previous presentation. Uh, it has the same um, numbers in it. Um, just to be clear, I did on the 20th um, present to the city council um, this particular version um, that had some, again, a few, uh, few slides in it um, that I thought were helpful to provide them the clarity of where we are. So the first, the first up is, again, the budget work sheet, which has us at, again, the highlighted in yellow um, um, in the bolded red are the factors that we have been paying attention to. The 3.80% uh, um, increase in our expenditure and the 5.91 on the tax rate. Um, and um, with the factors in yellow on the upper right-hand corners uh, staying in play uh, as we know them. Um, so that's where we currently are. Um, the, the budget tax rate history, again, the board has, has seen this before. Uh, the change in the tax rate on the far right, uh, five-year average at 0.99%, the 10-year average at 1.93, 1 
and then the, the spending uh, on the left, uh, 3.27 and um, 2.49 on the 10-year average. Um, next, again, is the, the reduction, and this is hard to see. Again, we have placed this on our, our website for anybody who wants to look at it. Again, the red line is drawn at a point where um, at, at a previous board meeting, we went through this um, um, with the board and the line came um, where it is. And if you see the respective number there, then you'll see where it has the total expense at 380 and the tax rate at 591. Um, I don't know what your pleasure is, um, Bridget or board members on this. I, so we certainly can go through it, but I think at this point, maybe I'd like to just move on. And then if you have specific questions uh, as a board, you can ask them. Um, I think a lot of them have been asked already. So what I might- Yeah, I would propose to go ahead and move through. And then if we have questions at the end of the budget presentation, um, we can ask those, but I don't feel the need to go line by line through this since we've done that a couple of times yeah. already. And then again, this is consistent what I did with the city and um, I've definitely heard from people that it was important to do this. So um, I think it's probably a little redundant to board members, but what I did on the next budget workshop sheet is um, just um, make the changes specific to the common level of appraisal because many people have said, you know, David, I don't understand when you say about the CLA. And so um, this with this particular slide, you see the 93.28, which is the exact same factor that was is in play right now. And um, this is the best way I felt I could explain it. It does not change the expenditure at 380, but it does change the tax rate. And it changes that obviously to 2.10. So the difference between 591 and 210 is all related to the common level of appraisal, important, right? It's how homes have been selling in South Burlington. Um, and it, we all know that that reappraisal's uh, upon us currently. So that's keeping, if we were to keep that the same, so you see what's happening. And then if we were to look at the next one, um, it shows you a little bit about then the net the net effect. Obviously, spending column does not change. Um, the tax rate obviously changes on the five year and the ten year uh, incrementally as such. The next uh, budget workshop sheet just simply kind of highlights what happens when uh, reappraisal happens at one hundred percent, and and what does that have to do with with taxes at the school side of things on the equation of the of the ed funding and so with the 100 percent again no change on expenditure you see what happens there is it's then a then a, a reduction in the tax rate on this end again um i think it's important again to note that this these are all factors associated with ed funding um so i'm not trying to curb that but it's important from what i've heard from other folks to be able to highlight that in a more specific way um, and David, can I just ask, do we have a sense given COVID-19 where the appraisal process is right now? I do not. I know it. I know it's happening. Um, um, I don't know uh, when they expect to, to fully complete um, on reappraisal. Um, I know we have Donna on. I don't know. Donna, yeah, you're hey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, From my understanding is they have really gone out and gotten not necessarily all of the information, but they've gotten enough that they've been able to go back and they're working on the data they've collected and ex extending it out to like, like properties and kind of stuff. So I don't think the city, you know, I, I'm not privy to all the information, but I have not heard that the appraisal is falling behind in any way that has been able to move on and things are expected to continue on as normal. Great, thank you, thank you, thank you Donna. So again, I highlight this only from the perspective, Bridget um, and board, that I've been asked this question a lot, and I have in past meetings said, you know, the um, the effect on the the common level of appraisal, and um, obviously we're in charge of of the expenditure line, and as you've heard, we have some factors associated with increasing enrollment, um, which is a big part of of that, as we've had some as we're adding some staff, so. Um, with that, um, we'll move on and you can see again the, the net result on the five and the 10 year trend similarly. So it has some of that variability. And again, I think that at a minus 1.5, 1 1.15 on the on the five year and 0 0.086 
on the change on the on the 10 year average. But this is in part kind of the, the big big area of concern and we've advocated, I have a little bit at the state level around some of this around tax stabilization. And um, this is this is the problem, uh, particularly when you put this in context of equalized pupil uh, counts up and down uh, on a two year average. And then you have CLA on fairly volatile factors have some major play in, um, in our inability to have stabilization. Um, so anyway, um, that's where we are uh, related to, to those. And um, I don't have a lot more other than to just end with, um, um, rather than just to end with the, the, um, the back of the, the budget cover sheet. And the first one is representative of what went out in the, to the community or actually what is available to the community, both city and school. And so in the upper portion, you see uh, the 2020 and the 2019 years um, for both city and the city increases. And then the next uh, middle sheet part of the sheet is the, is the school. On the lower side, it shows uh, the increase and decrease on the city and the school side. So um, currently at the $100,000, you've got $16 increase for, um, for the, on the 100,000 at city, 180 um, for the school, and then 38, 422, 55 and 613 respectively on, on those items related to where we are, uh, where we were going to be. The next one demonstrates and shows the, the um, increases at 380, increase on expenditure and 591. Um, moving down the middle of the sheet, bottom, middle, um, you've got the city at $38 uh, or 16 on the 195 for the school, middle column is 38, 223 and then um, 55 and 325 respectively. So that's where we are um, related to that. And I'm turning it back over uh, to board members for, for questions. And um, just to note, I did get a text message here. Elizabeth will be back on. Oh, there she is. Back on. Um, yeah, so um, just a second ago. So I don't know, again, what questions you have board um, related to the budget and where we are. Um, I'm happy to, to answer questions and or I can call on some of my administrators that are on if there are questions. Board members, do we have any questions? We've talked a lot about it uh, so far, so I wouldn't be surprised if we don't have too many. Okay, seeing none, I'm just gonna check we have a question. Um, from Margo Nelson Rogers saying, where do contract negotiations stand currently? You do have that on your agenda um, coming up, but I don't know, Bridget or board members, if you wanted to. I think it's okay to address it in this context too. Um, don't you, Elizabeth? Yeah, I think that's fine. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to address that, Bridget. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, sorry, I can't change my name. I have switched my phone because my, my tablet died. So I'm going to, I'm thankfully I had another device. Um, as far as contract negotiations go, we still are, uh, have three open collective bargaining agreements. We have not had um, a lot of meetings. The first meeting was held this week with the administrators, um, with a working subcommittee of Martin and Brian. Um, and uh, at this point, we also have no proposals out as well. Um, so uh, our, our goal continues to be to resolve those in a manner that is supportive of the budget and um, uh, and is uh, reflective of the um, uh, both the times we're in as well as the the hard work that all of our employees offer the district and our students. Okay. Um, let me check. No other written questions. Um, Annie Luke, you have your hand up. Annie, have you unmuted yourself? Annie, we can't hear you. Um, if we can't hear you, I'm going to need to. Yeah. She's good, I think, now. It's... Yeah. Steve, can you make sure she's unmuted from our end? There we go. Yeah, yeah. 
Hi there. There was something in front of the button that didn't allow me to speak. No worries, Annie. It was our fault. Sorry. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. This is April 29th. Since March 11th, there have not been any changes to speak of made in the way of trying to get your budget proposal numbers down. That's seven weeks. Why haven't why hasn't more effort been made to whittle down the budget figures more in the meantime? And are you that confident that the taxpayers will be satisfied with your current proposal, given the current dire financial environment we're experiencing, as well as all the articles recently written about the insolvency of the State Education Fund? <clears throat> I'll address the first part. Uh, we do feel like there have been significant, uh, I, I do feel like David has presented us uh, with significant changes to the budget uh, since March um, and did go through a process with his administrators. And I do feel like um, we've, we've gone through in great detail in previous meetings, um, things that are being or have been taken out of the expense budget. Um, I think the whole state is, is waiting to see um, what federal funding will do uh, to the ed fund um, and uh, there's not a lot more clarity that we can offer on that um, from my perspective as a single board member i'm not speaking for the whole board i feel like we have a responsibility to be prepared to educate kids when they come back in the fall if indeed they do come back immediately in the fall um, and there are going to be great needs from those kids having been off um, out of the buildings uh, for several months at that stage. And I feel like the administration has worked very hard to present to us a budget um, that continues to meet those needs. Um, but I would open it up for other board members to respond and David as well. I don't know if you have anything to add. No, again, there was some iterative uh, steps along the way. We've come from the 11.22% tax rate down to where we are now with, it's been an iterative process. and. Um, I would say, you know, the board did grant some additional time here um, prior to it was looking at making, uh, adopting the budget a, a few weeks ago, and I think felt that it was important to give a little bit longer opportunity for, for, for community feedback, which, which we've had and I think has been important for people to understand. We have, we have made changes along the way, certainly from the March 11th time period. Yeah, Bridget, can I offer some thoughts there too? Sure, of course. Yeah, I think, you know, from, from my perspective, I do think administration has done um, a good job of really revisiting things. And we're, we're teetering on that edge, in my opinion, of um, really, you know, kind of kicking the can down the road relative to some projects that we're deferring that may come up again in the near term um, and, and potentially have the, the risk of being even more expensive down the road vis-a-vis -vis capital projects and so forth. Um, I think on balance, um, we had, we've got some great communication from community members on specific suggestions of things to look at and um, it, to, to list a few of those, like looking at hiring restrictions. And I do think administration has taken a look at um, really linking hiring to increased enrollment um, with some offsetting reductions as well. Um, and we're, we're a little different than the higher ed system in that, um, and a business where for instance, if your demand goes down or your orders dry up, you can adjust your business model accordingly. Um, you can sometimes control the selection, you know, of your choice of raw materials that come in and look at a less expensive vendor. You can, um, look at moving, you know, moving this, your service or manufacturing to a, a less expensive country, for instance. But we know our enrollment's going up. We, uh, we really, um, you know, look at the student population we have and we have to serve by state law. We have to serve the various needs of those students coming in. Um, we've looked at things, for instance, uh, like reductions in discretionary spending. And I think administration has got, done a good job at looking at many of those. I know there are some areas where there may, dis may be disagreement on the magnitude of reductions that were made, but I think the administration has presented those to the board. I think we have revisited capital projects and allocated those in a way that have 
uh, mitigated kind of the risk associated with not doing them with the most important ones that are largely related to safety and future expense. Um, and I think organizational efficiencies is another area that we can continue to look at, but it's also one of those areas that you don't, um, you can't necessarily uh, do that in a short period of time without having expertise looking at that that really looks at the service you're delivering. And lastly, I think salary reductions is an area that higher ed, for instance, has been able to look at. And with, you know, with 80% of our school spending, any school spending related to wages and benefits, um, the largest benefit right now is the healthcare benefit. And that is now will be dictated by state, um, a state award. Um, and we have uh, three bargaining units that are in process right now. We also are looking at significant revenue impacts that uh, affect the edge fund. And we've heard shortfalls that range from anywhere from, you know, in the 60s to, to 70 million to up until the 150 to 200 million, all of those impacted by revenue sources that contribute to the ed fund. And that is something that will affect the state um, in its entirety. And we will certainly participate in um, helping understand the service we collectively deliver at the state level, but also how the, both the federal funding and how those revenue impacts will need to change potentially an entire state model. Um, and then lastly, the impact of restarting schools. Um, I, I think Bridget mentioned this, but really looking at the preparedness of our students coming back into the schools, the preparedness of staff and, and the facilities as well. So. I really look on balance against a number of those areas that you would typically look at in a situation that we're in, balanced with the service we are obligated to deliver and think, I believe we're kind of at that tipping point of not, you know, not risking completely decimating the service we're delivering, but recalibrating to the point where we can work with our, our state, around the state, to really look at um, deliberately um, and intentionally potentially redefining the service we're delivering with public education um, because the current cost is does reflect what the state has valued or what our communities valued. And um, I think as a board, we're trying to balance those two entities for at least this coming operating year. Sorry, that was really long winded, but um, Obviously, I think we're all very concerned about the financial impact on all of our community, yet continuing to um, provide a service that um, our community has valued in the past and we, we hope and believe will continue to value. Are there other board members that have thoughts? So uh, just uh, very quickly, I, I... I can't really add much beyond what uh, Bridget and Elizabeth have just said. I just want to voice my agreement with uh, what the two of you have said. And, and mainly, we're not going to be able to solve the statewide uh, budget issue and, and uh, education fund issue on, on our particular budget. Uh, we really have to pay attention to the service to our students. So, but I agree with Elizabeth and Bridget. All right, I, I guess I, I'll go next. Um, thank you, Elizabeth and Bridget, for the time to, to speak. Yeah, I think, I think this budget is a good compromise. And what I've learned about compromises from studying current events is that some people say a good compromise is something that nobody on either side is happy with. And I can see, you know, I can hear from people who are unhappy with the cuts that we have made and people who are unhappy with the cuts that we have not made. And, and that's where I think yep, we have to balance the two and get to that compromise. So I, I think we've reached a good middle ground. And I think that if we were to go further, we would start to impact the quality of education in South Burlington pretty badly to the point where South Burlington would be less of a desirable place for people to relocate to and raise their families. And when you consider that, then you realize that our grand list might start to take a hit if we can't have uh, maintain the quality education that we're known for. 
Uh, there are some school districts in Chittenden County that have a chronic problem passing budgets. And if you wanna take the value of your house in South Burlington and compare the value of a comparable house in that particular town, which I'm, I'm not gonna name, uh, you'll find that uh, South Burlington's grand list, I don't know, gets a good 20, 25% premium just for being South Burlington and uh, just being who we are. And so I think it's this is in the best interest of everybody, whether you have kids in school or not, and whether you care about public education or not, uh, that we get this budget passed and, and we keep it at this level. Um, further cuts would just be harmful to our education. Um, and um, I also, I also want to expand on what Martin said about the, um, the education fund. I don't think South Burlington should take on the role of a Charles Atlas and carry the burden of the rest of Vermont and the education fund. I think South Burlington needs to be on uh, equal footing uh, with other school districts that have passed budgets. Uh, and we should not be saying, all right, well, there's a deficit in the state revenues so why don't we just level fund or, or cut even further? Uh, that's not our responsibility. And uh, so I'm, I'm gonna say that I think we should just shrug off that uh, duty or the suggestion that we take on that duty for the rest of Vermont. No, we, we need to look out for ourselves and I think we should do that. Um, and I, I think we've done a good job listening to our constituents on, on either side. Um, you know, it, it's okay if you wanna send your kids to Rice or homeschool your kids, that's fine. I still. Uh, I'm obliged and I'm happy to represent you, but I can't go to the extent that you're asking me to. Uh, and so I've got to find a balance. And I think that's what this budget does. It finds a, a decent balance and it provides some continuity of quality for South Burlington. Um, I had a lot more that I'd love to say, but I think I'm gonna leave it at that. Thank you. Brian, um, did you have anything that you wanted to add? I I think you guys have basically said all. I would just like to thank administration for taking a serious look at the budget, for deferring the expenses they could, for cutting where they were able to, and for preserving the great education that we deliver. Um, I think this is a fair budget. I think they've truly looked everywhere that they could to get rid of expenses or to defer them. Um, and I hope the public will agree. But um, I hope everybody can get behind this budget. I certainly am. Uh, we have another hand raised, Margo Rogers. Go ahead. Hi, yes, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, when I hear you say that South Burlington shouldn't be the one to take on the burden and the responsibility for the state, I guess I get a little frustrated with that because South Burlington has historically taken on the burden of, you know, being the bellwether for the unions the, the teachers are paid a premium and it's used as a bellwether for for all other uh, school districts and uh, you know you talk about uh, the great results of South Burlington and we wouldn't be who we are and all of this but we're not even in the top five according to a recent US News and World Report um, of the um, quality of the schools and in the state of Vermont, we aren't even in the top five. So it's really frustrating to me to, you know, hear you talk about not taking on the burden when we have, in fact. And another thing that frustrates me is, um, had we been, had we offered, had you offered up what uh, a reasonable proposal for, uh, maintenance of the school, none of which or virtually none of which is in this current budget, which we all know needs to happen at some point. And some of the reasons why you said, gee, we should build a new school and instead of fixing up the school is because it would disrupt students who, you know, because we can't do it all in the summer. If we'd offered up a reasonable proposal at that time that the community could support, this would have been the perfect you would have had the funds and this would have been the perfect opportunity to make those um, repairs and things when everybody's out of school so i guess those are just a couple things that come to mind but i for one will not be voting yes on this budget i think it's 
you know, maybe a 3.8% uh, increase might be, you know, acceptable in a booming time, but we aren't in a booming time. We're in a crisis. And the people of Vermont and the people of the world are in crisis. And I, for one, won't be voting yes on this budget for all the reasons I've stated. Thank you for that feedback. Um, we have two questions um, in the queue in written form. Um, one is uh, from Andy Samara. He says, apologies if this was answered in the first part of the meeting. I just recently logged on. What will the board and clerk's office be doing to make sure that everyone who wants an absentee ballot gets one before the vote in late May? The vote will be heavily consequential and I'm concerned about asking people to vote as normal amidst the pandemic. How can we ensure safety of voters so they can turn out? Andy, we did in fact talk about that earlier in the meeting uh, because we wanted to make sure that Donna could provide feedback uh, from the Board of Civil Authority um, about voting procedures and things um, so that she could maybe drop off if she needed to. Um, and the answer is there's gonna be a lot of advertising and a lot of focus on making sure that people um, have the opportunity to absentee ballot and, and in fact encourage them. Donna went through in detail, you can probably listen to a recording of the meeting if you'd like um, in detail some of the procedures that they are talking about um, at the city level and or at the Board of Civil Authority level in terms of making sure that voting in person is safe. Um, so limiting uh, extensively the number of people who are in a specific space at a specific time, those kinds of things. So I hope that answers your question. Um, we can talk about it a bit more when we get to the meeting morning um, if, if everyone chooses to. Um, Marla Weiner asks, um, how can you continue to defend the high salaries of teachers and administrators based on the current information available showing that South Burlington is no longer considered in the top five of school districts in the state with regard to test scores, especially with the financial uncertainty we are all facing? Uh, am I unmuted, Bridget? Whoops, sorry. Yes, you're unmuted. We can hear you. Uh, if I can respond to two two questions, uh, I respond to that one, but also uh, in partial response to Margo's earlier question about the, the bear the burden comment. I think the framing of that, and Alex, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's in reference to the fact that there's about 18 districts or supervisory unions that do not have approved budgets right now. Um, and that represents about 15%, I believe, of the total ed fund. So those districts who either had failed budgets or budgets that weren't scheduled to, um, to, to uh, or to be had up and uh, post the March timeframe. Um, I think that the comment about where the burden is that those budgets are all being framed right now in the context of the current economic situation and some knowledge of a, um, of a potential significant ed fund deficit, which we don't know what the impact of the um, of the federal funding will be on that in the short term or the long term specifically. So I think that comment was specific to those districts that don't have an approved budget, um, really um, setting the bar that's uh, really different than about 85% of those districts that currently tap into the ad fund. And, and Elizabeth, sorry to interrupt for one second too. I did just want to add to that comment that um, David and I learned last week when we testified uh, with regard to what the House is proposing to do um, about the gap in the education fund and about the um, really more about the budgets that have not been approved yet, that the average percentage increase in the draw from the ed fund of the budgets that have been approved so far um, is about 4%. And we are right in line with where that is. So this budget would put us right in line with the bulk of the ones that have been approved so far. If we were to make enormous cuts before the whole state figures out what it's going to do, it would put South Burlington students at a disadvantage um, having simply, simply by the fact that we did not have a budget approved before the pandemic hit. So sorry to interrupt your flow, Elizabeth. I just wanted to add that statistic that we learned on Friday. Yeah, no, thank you for that, Bridget. And and to um, to the last comment, um, I think that the one I, I am not familiar with the reference study that that you indicated that South Burlington is not in the top five. Um, I think depending on you know an, any number of barometers we've looked at, our our students really have um, excelled on many fronts um, in terms of 
both their academic accomplishments, their civic accomplishments, the their work and life experiences and, and the colleges or, or um, work that they do uh, after uh, graduating from South Burlington. So um, certainly we have a lot of great schools in the state, um, but we do believe uh, almost all measures, we, we fare very well uh, from that standpoint. So I'd be happy to receive any information that either call or reference um, to share. Uh, and, at, and specific to the salary component, um, again, the we do have a significant portion of our um, employee base, largely our teachers, that um, are, have master's plus 30, which is basically years of experience and educational levels that um, have a significant tenure with the district that do contribute to the quality of education. And it's a result of um, negotiated uh, collective bargaining agreements over many years that contribute to that portion of the budget. And I'm not saying it's right, wrong, or indifferent, but um, uh, I think the notion that um, that exclusively creates a, a bellwether of South Burlington in the state is, uh, is partly a reflection of the, the season tenure staff we have, um, and yes, partly the collective bargaining agreements itself, uh, but also reflective of the fact that wages and benefits are a significant part of any budget. And um, the state made a decision to look at health care benefits on a statewide basis. They may make different decisions in the future as well. Thanks, Elizabeth. Richard, can I, I want to mention that that survey of or ranking of Vermont schools. Um, I, I, I'll get myself in trouble for this, but I, I don't mind at this point. Um, that particular survey that did not have South Burlington in the top five had Milton at number two. And I'm just gonna leave it at that. Um, okay, uh, we have another question in writing from John Stern. He says, I would like to know what the budget covers specifically with regards to mitigating the effects of COVID-19 for the students next year. If I recall, this budget was prepared before COVID-19 and was paired back from the original proposal, so it does not contain any specifics regarding COVID-19. What is the plan? So, Bridget, I, I mean, I think um, if anyone can particularly point me to exactly where we'll be uh, a month from now, two months from now, six, six months from now, we don't know. But what we do know is that we're going to need the resources that we've identified in the budget to be able to respond, um, I think, as as um, many of you, the board members have indicated, academically, socially, and emotionally to our students in whatever capacity that is. We certainly hope that we're back in the school, in our schools, and occupying them as we would have in, in the past. Um, but if we are not able to, we'll have to come up with a different plan. And currently having staff available to do that will help mitigate uh, and respond to the COVID-19 situation. I think when we look at universal precautions, I think we're gonna be more adapt at that. We're gonna be more aware of what we're gonna say, physical distance, distancing. And I do think um, it's important to note we're trying to get away from the word social distancing because we don't want people to socially separate. We want them to be physically mindful of their space and their, and their surroundings, but not social distanced um, from the perspective of the importance of uh, helpful social emotional behaviors. So, um, you know, we, I think, you know, you've heard uh, from nutrition service and transportation have been functioning. Uh, and many of our, our teachers um, are certainly aware of where we are with responding to the COVID-19. Um, and we, again, I think we'll be ready to deploy that more further if we have to, uh, whether it's in a, you know, a smaller uh, numbered classroom or different number of students in the cafeteria. We know we're, we're kind of thinking, uh, again, I talked about options before, which the administrators and I have talked about. You know, we have several options on the table uh, of which we talked about, as I said today, that include all of us, including operations folks as well, so. Thank you for that, David. Do any of the other administrators have anything to add to that? Okay. Um, then that kind of leaves us with any further board discussion. We are warned for action. Um, 
We have no more questions from the public at the moment, um, and we are warned for action on the budget tonight. Does anyone else have anything, other thoughts to add or any other questions before we move forward with that? Um, Bridget, if I could add one more comment. Um, I do I do want to remind the board and, and the community that um, any, uh, any additional operating, um, uh, you know, um, surplus that might be generated um, from an approved budget does roll over into a future, uh, future budget year. And that is one of the things like David mentioned early on some decisions about spring sports, for instance, and, and there may be other areas. And I, Again, I, I would also say there may be some offsetting expenses that we're not aware of right now that David alluded to with potentially restarting school as well. But um, just a reminder that uh, I think, um, I believe our administration will be very diligent about managing whatever budget the community supports and, and uh, make efforts to roll that forward, particularly in light of what we're continuing to learn, um, maybe, uh, maybe turn out to be a local responsibility relative to the ed fund um, and, and past practice there uh, or how much funding deficit is covered on a going forward basis. So I just want to remind people of that. Thank you, Elizabeth. So then I'll ask, do I have a motion to approve the budget as presented by administration uh, in the amount of $53,715,472 for the um, FY 2020-2021 uh, budget. Is there a second? Uh, I have a second. Okay. Martin, I think you said second. I saw you say second, but you need to unmute. There you go. I thought I had muted second. Second. Okay, um, any further discussion? I think we should do a roll call vote just because of the, the right. enormity of this particular item. Um, mm -hmm. So I'll take a roll call. Um, Elizabeth. Aye. Martin. Yes. Brian. Aye. Alex. Aye. And I'll vote aye. So uh, it is unanimous uh, that we will put that amount on the um, on the ballot for a vote. Um, Bridget, and, do you want me to respond to Dan's question or not? Um, I will read Dan's question. I don't think that we need to respond to it necessarily, but I will read it. Dan Emmons says, Alex, that was an unacceptable, arrogant, and elitist comment. You are a representative of the South Burlington taxpayers. That was uncalled for. So I, I think that's I, really more of a comment than a question. Yeah. Um, so I think we should move along um, since we have approved the budget to um, agenda item number nine, which is considered a special meeting warning for the May 28th vote. So I think we need to just discuss and make sure that we're all still comfortable given what we've heard from Donna Kinville um, and the Board of Civil Authority that we're all comfortable, um, first of all, with a May 28th vote. And then from there, we'll have to read the full meeting warning and approve that language. So if I could just comment. Uh, sure. So <clears throat> I'm really deferring to the board, uh, to the Secretary of State and to uh, uh, Donna. And uh, if, they're able to say we're able to proceed with uh, this vote in a safe manner, which is my understanding that that was the vote, uh, the board's vote, uh, then I, I think we should go forward with it on the 28th. Anyone else have anything to add? I think Donna, Donna wanted to. Donna does. <laughs> okay, um, Donna. At, so at our board meeting, um, I, I, I should, point out that there were some board members who did request the school to put off the vote, but if it were to be May 28th, this is what they wish to have to go forward. So there was there was some concern about having the May 28th date. Um, and I just, I, I have to bring that forward as that was one of the things the boards wanted to bring forth to the school board. Um, but if it's May 28th, we're prepared to go on. Thank you, Donna. Any other thoughts? 
I just wanted to respond a little bit to Donna. Um, one of the, the things that was sort of, um, David and I, as we mentioned before, testified um, as part of a group of, of school districts that did not have budgets approved yet um, on Friday. We um, testified before the House Ed and uh, Ways and Means Committees. And, and there were a lot of questions and, and some communities where they still do voice votes um, where those will be nearly impossible to do unless they completely change their voting procedures to Australian ballot or some other form of voting um, and whether they change that on a dime or not to respond to this. So there is a lot of concern um, amongst all those school districts. But then there was really the question of um, uh, that's really what the House is considering right now, what to do if no um, budget can be approved um, before um, June 30, which is kind of the deadline for having a budget approved for next school year. Um, and the, the bill um, that the House is considering has one of two options for districts. One is to uh, level fund um, and have the board approve that level funded budget. And two is to, um, is to have the board approve um, a school board approve a budget as long as it is um, lower than an amount of a failed budget from a previous failed budget or lower than an amount that's been warned uh, to the community. And so that's still under discussion at the house. Um, I think most of us were still hoping that we could have uh, a vote because it allows um, taxpayers the most ability to weigh in on funding for next year. So thank you for sharing your concerns and those of some of the folks on the Board of Civil Authority. So, so I would like to comment again, though. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't feel that I'm in a position or have the expertise to say that it's uh, we can proceed with the vote on uh, whatever the date is. And, and I have really been deferring to uh, the Secretary of State, first of all, as well as the city clerk and, and also the board. Um, and I want to their message that uh, that they can make this safe, uh, they can do things that will make the voting safe uh, before I would proceed and want to warn that. So that's that's one issue. The, the other is if if the um, legislature and and I don't know if I see any signs that they're moving very rapidly on this issue, but if the legislature does go forward and say that you can approve a budget that's lower than what you have warned to the voters. What position would we be in if we go ahead and warn this budget and then that legislation comes out? Does that mean that we would have to go back to the drawing board and have a budget that is less than what we just approved now because we will have warned it? And I think my suggestion is to make sure that we have the answer to that and we have the answer to the safety issue if we can uh, postpone the vote on the warning to next meeting which is one week from today if that does not put us off as far as uh, being able to have the vote on the 28th yeah martin i don't know um what's happened since friday um what um uh, Chairperson Webb um, had said is that given what she had heard, she believed what was in uh, the draft 6.1, which was the one that was presented to all of us before we testified, she believed that they would be moving forward with that. Um, and in that, it doesn't specify how much lower the budget has to be um, from one that has been warned or one that has failed. Um, so I don't know that it would necessarily be a back to the drawing board situation. It would need to be lower, but there's no specificity around that. I don't know if that specificity might get added as things, you know, move forward through that process. But at, at the moment, it wasn't in there on Friday um, was my last understanding. My only concern is if we put off um, approving the date until um, next week's meeting, um, that gives us one week less um, to get absentee ballots out if we do decide to go on May 20th. I see Donna nodding. Um, and I just, I want to make sure that as many people, if we decide to go forward, um, that as many people as possible can absentee vote um, to make it safer for everyone. 
And I think putting it off a week, if we really do think that May 28th would be the right date, um, would um, just put us in a tougher situation and making sure that vote goes smoothly. That's my thought, but I have a view that I don't, I'm not an expert and I don't, I don't have the ability to decide whether May 28th is a safe date. I'm guided by the Secretary of State and, and the Board of Civil Authorities vote um, in my thinking that May 28th is the right date, um, in part because um, if we were to fail again on May 28th, that would still give us one more opportunity um, to go before voters. And I really want to make sure that we are going before voters, even though it would potentially be an option um, if the House does you know, move their bill forward and it is approved. Um, it would potentially be an option for us to just adopt a budget as a board. I would much, much, much rather be in a position of um, the voters of South Burlington uh, having weighed in on a budget as opposed to, to using that clause. Yeah, totally agree, Bridget. I mean, we've been told that the 28th could work. We have to give Donna and her people a chance to make it work. And if the vote does fail, then yes, I want to be able to go back to people a third time too. So totally agree with the logic. Yeah, Bridget, um, I, I also wanted to say, it sounds like I might have a little background noise, so I apologize. Um, but um, I uh, I was on the Board of Civil Authority meeting, and my recollection, Donna, was some of it was a, a, some of the feedback on a further delay on the vote past May 28 um, was nonspecific as to a timing, but some of it was even talking about that early the first week of June. And if you look at the calendar, the the days it buys you are pretty few. And I know there was almost a little bit of a, um, uh, you know, maybe a, a mental kind of logistical uh, feel good about having a June date versus a May. But um, uh, that was the general feeling I got. But also, uh, I think um, I want to reinforce that I believe David and Bridget in their testimony on Friday did indicate a strong preference um, rather than uh, being in a position to um, comply with the bill that may or may not pass um, relative to the board's authority on a budget, that it was South Burlington's strong preference to ensure taking that to a community vote. Thanks, Bridget. Thank you. We have a couple of written um, questions or comments. Um, Noah Everett asks, I am wondering if medical professionals we're consulted regarding this plan for voting. Um, I would have to ask Donna if that was something that happened or if this is really based on what's coming from Montpelier and the governor's office. We did not, the Board of Civil Authority did not address um, the health care profession um, or the, the state um, in that case, but we were following the Secretary of State's guidelines in which they had um, in their background, the health researchers the health background. Um, we're not expertise. We're 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 commonly people. Um, so we were really de um, following the state guidelines of what the professionals have been saying. Yeah, I, I think again, I was on as Elizabeth said, uh, and watching kind of Donna's group work. And what I took away was I, I know that. Um, Guidance came out on April 24th, I believe, on regarding the Act 92 that was passed and it provided, I think, her group with very specific guidance on authority to go forward and to allow uh, the processes to happen for uh, elections. And again, they reviewed those diligently, those options. And again, they are supported by the Secretary of State's office. Um, and again, I think that's important to note that if they were not, then we would be concerned. But this is something that's state state supported, and I think we'll continue to take direction, certainly on how to prepare the school based on what Donna wants that would adhere to the appropriate guidelines of um, physical distancing um, while people come in and do what they need to do and vote. So anyway, I just wanna make that point. And we Thank will do you. things at the polls such as bring your own pen um kind of things will will be out front of the whole thing to advertise how to make the voting at the polls if you decide to go that route safe for you as well as for the workers um, and give them tips and that we will consult the, the um experts on 
Thank you. And then last comment that I have um, in writing is uh, from John Stern. It says, not a question. I just want Alex to know that I very much appreciate his perspective on the value of the school to the value of the community. Thanks, John. Um, and that is all I have for questions and comments uh, from, oh, there's one more. Uh, Deanne Emmons says, am I correct in understanding that if the state cannot support the state portion of the budget, then the full cost burden falls entirely on the citizens of South Burlington? Well, again, remember it's a statewide, it's a statewide system. And I think as people have noted is, as they, the state looks to uh, the total amount of revenue that's going to come in and they have to make appropriate adjustments. And so that is in part what's being discussed currently in the legislature and look in the joint physical office, fiscal office to look at what, where are we and what do we need to do? And there's some, a variety of options out there, but this is not um, only a South Burlington issue. It's a statewide issue. Um, and there's many statewide issues associated with with revenue at the moment as a result of COVID-19. So again, we're, we're paying attention to that. Uh, it would be my, my response, but it's a, a shared responsibility. Yeah, if I could add to that, David, I think, I think maybe Dan took that from my comment that, that if there was, uh, if communities had to participate in shoring up some of that shortfall to the Ed Fund, um, based on what the state comes with that part that's partly informed by um the the district's experience with the health care recapture charge so um I, i'm that that was my frame of reference in making that comment that if part of the um solution on a going forward basis is that communities um need to participate at some level for instance uh and and i won't offer what that may be, but if there was some percentage, for instance, we along with all other communities would be faced with that challenge. Yeah, so to be to be really clear with, with um, the, the response would be no, it would not fall on South Burlington. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so um, I guess then we, uh, we have it warned for action to consider the meeting warning. Are we in a place where people are comfortable um, discussing the meeting warning? Are we comfortable with a May 28th vote? And should we go ahead and um, and read out the meeting warning and try to take action on that? Or are we not comfortable at this stage? I basically, this is basically a straw poll at the moment to see where we are. Yeah, Bridget, um, I, I would say for the reasons that you and Donna both identified of once we secure a date, then it allows Donna to do her work to um, ascertain, you know, all the logistics of moving forward. I do certainly um, reserve the possibility that we might get feedback for some reason um, with new information that it, that's not a possibility, but I think um, I think the city clerk needs a definitive date to be able to move forward. And Donna, correct me if I'm wrong there. You're right, Lisbeth, thank you. Okay, then is it the pleasure of the rest of the board that I read out the, the draft meeting warning um, for approval? Yes, Okay. Sure, yeah, please. Um, so the warning reads, uh, warning city of South Burlington school district 2020 special meeting, the legal voters of the city of South Burlington school district are hereby notified and warned to meet at their respective polling places at the Frederick H. Tuttle middle school on Dorset street, the orchard school on Baldwin Avenue and the Chamberlain school on white street on Thursday, May 28, 2020 at seven o'clock in the morning, at which time the polls will open until seven o'clock in the evening, at which time the polls will close to vote by Australian ballot on the following article. Article one, budget. Shall the voters of the city of South Burlington School District approve the school board to expend $53,715,472.00, which is the amount the school board has determined to be necessary for the ensuing fiscal year. It is estimated that this proposed budget, if approved, will result in education spending 
of $16,614.42 per equalized pupil. This projected spending for equalized pupil is 4.35% more than the spending for the current year. Polling places are the Frederick H. Tuttle Middle School at 500 Dorset Street, the Orchard School at 2 Baldwin Avenue, and the Chamberlain School at 262 White Street. Voters are to go to the polling place in their respective district. So do I have a motion to approve uh, the warning for the special meeting for the budget? Yep, Brian here, so moved. Do I have yep. a second? I will second Alex here. Okay, and let's do a roll call vote as we did on the previous item. Um, I'll start with Elizabeth. <laughs> Aye. Uh, Martin. Yes. Uh, Brian. Aye. Alex. Yes. And I vote aye, so that is a unanimous approval of the meeting warning for the special meeting. Okay, any other thoughts before we move on with the agenda? Okay, I'm just double checking, no more questions. Okay, um, we will then move on to item number 10, um, executive limitations policy and procedure review, uh, which is warned for action. This is the second reading on the guidelines on social media communications. Uh, Bridget, can I go back one second? Sure. Sorry, I couldn't unmute myself fast enough. <laughs> uh, one quick question. We, we don't say anything in the warning, nor do I think we should necessarily about um, encouraging absentee voting, but in is there a way when we post the warning that we can support um, uh, the city clerk's work and highlight that in some way in a, a header or footer or something to that, um, you know, that effect. We can certainly ask Elizabeth, but I don't, I don't believe so. The warning, I mean, there's very specific um, requirements on the warning and we, we often, I mean, obviously we seek legal guidance to put the warning together. Certainly happy to ask. Maybe there's other things that we can do in communicating the date uh, in a more public way, but we can't we can't <coughs> change from what I understand. But we can certainly ask um, the warning. Yeah, I would say as well that we should probably try to get an ad in the other paper as soon as possible, um, as well as uh, notice on Front Porch Forum, um, any place that we can. We should probably use the board web page in this instance or the board Facebook page in this instance as well. Um, just to try to reach as many people as we can um, to let them know that we did approve May 28th as the date and that we're encouraging everyone to vote absentee um, who is able to do that. Mm -hmm. Yes, Donna. Um, could you also possibly advertise um, that, put my email address in there as a way for people to request it or to go through um, the Secretary of State has a, your My Voter page where people can actually go in and request a ballot. Yeah. It's just with staff being on furlough, if they really want to get these ballots out as much as they can, I can't be on the phone answering and writing down everybody's name. I'd like, it's good to have something just in front of me. So if we could find some way to promote those two as the first way in order to request this. Um, that would be helpful. And, and I'm going to be doing front porch forums posting as well and uh, other paper stuff. So maybe we can coordinate so we're not kind of crossing on that. That sounds great. Okay. Any other thoughts? Okay. Uh, we can go back to um, item number 10 regarding the social communications or social media communications policy. I believe there was a small update to that yes. that's highlighted in yellow. Yep. And so we, we added this, um, and you'll see it here in a second, um, item number 10, um, not post anonymously about district business. And we've taken that out and proposed the board members are entitled to express their personal opinions on district matters. It is expected, however, that board members will not confuse or mislead the public by anonymous, anonymously engaging in electronic or other communications about the district or by using accounts that are registered under other names. It is a district policy that board members should accurately identify themselves when publicly discussing the district. That was the, the, 
the change. And again, this is second reading. Um, Does anyone have any questions or comments about the social media communications policy? Well, just a question, or maybe it's just a comment. I don't have any problems with any of it, but I don't know where in our policy manual that it says that we should accurately identify ourselves. I mean, I certainly agree that we should, but I don't know if it's stipulated. Again, these are in social media, they're guidelines. Yeah. Right. And so part of, you know, you probably could be enveloped under board code of conduct, you know, yeah. some of those things. It provides guidelines and clarity around um, specific to board members. Yeah. Yeah. Um Bridget, uh, briefly, I read something about the Burlington City Council had some language in a social media policy that they recently introduced, and I was trying to look it up while we were talking, but um, I think I think we address it with this change, but I might just um, suggest that uh, David make a note to look up that language and consider it for a future modification if it's more relevant. So are you proposing that we not take action on this tonight and do that next year when we review it again? Or are you proposing that we, um, or, uh, I guess I'm just asking, are you proposing that we not take action tonight or are you proposing that we go ahead and take action and then just address it later? I, I'm proposing that I think we can take action based on the modification that was made and just make note that um, there is some recent activity that might more, that might add value once we review this in the future. That was the Burlington City Council, Elizabeth? Yes, yeah. Do any other board members have any thoughts or questions about the social media communications policy? I'm okay with it. Yep, good here. Okay, so do I have a motion um, to approve the social media and communications policy? Uh, with the change that was provided. Ryan, so moved. I'll second? second. I'll okay. second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. You get all that? <laughs> yep, the motion passes. Um, any further discussion? No. Um, then we will move on to uh, agenda item number 11, negotiations update. And this is just for discussion tonight. Elizabeth, would you like to provide a little bit of an update? I can. Um, I think we, we briefly discussed this in response to an individual's question earlier on, uh, but we are um, in negotiations with three collective bargaining units at this point. We have not made a lot of progress only because of um, scheduling uh, and, and workload issues. Um, we, uh, we, the board has no specific uh, financial proposals uh, out at this point. Um, and as I mentioned previously, um, any, you know, any um, uh, potential uh, overage in any budget that's approved by the community would roll forward into a future budget as a credit. And we're working diligently to resolve uh, those um, contracts as soon as possible. Martin or Brian, anything to add? Okay. Not at this point. All right. Um, then we will move along to item number 12, other paper articles. There was a list in your packet, I believe, um, that Delaney is on the list for an article about mental health. Um, that would be due um, in a couple of days and would run in the five seven issue. Um, Bridget, can you still hear me? Yeah, yeah I um, still hear you. Yes, we have received a draft of Delaney's article looking for feedback. I did not circulate that to the full board, um, but I can do that at the cl actually. Delaney, are you still on? She yes, is I still am. on. Yeah. Oh, would you mind? Um, or actually, I'm sorry, David, you have this. Would you mind um, forwarding it to the entire board for feedback? But Delaney, it looked um, very good from my perspective. So thank you for doing that. Thank you. Um, thank you, Delaney. If I may, Bridget. Sure. Um, Elizabeth also reached out to Delaney and myself about um, possibly drafting an article um, about online learning, which I know is um, listed later. 
Um, and I just wanted to let you know that we, um, just before tonight's meeting, got together um, over FaceTime and did get an article drafted up. So we oh, have wonderful. that on retainer for you guys. Thank you. Great. That's wonderful. Great work, nice guys. Nice job, Thank you. Cole and Delaney. Awesome. Um, we'll look for that one, too. Do we have other ideas out beyond um, that would run in the, the 6-4 issue? Do we have um, any other ideas for an article uh, that would probably be due at the end of June that would run in early July? I think I mean, a lot of that is sort of the wrap up of the school year, obviously, and how that turned out and <laughs> and where we stand heading into next year. There is sort of a lot of things to talk about, probably with regard to where we stand at the end of the year. Yeah, I'd be happy to raise my hand to work on that one. Um, it's about my turn, it looks like. <laughs> um, are there other ideas that we want to put on or do we want to call it uh, good enough to have two more ideas on the already on the list? Well, I hate to volunteer somebody else, but if Martin gets bumped from June 4th, is there any point in doing a legislative update later on? Well, the legislature supposedly is going to be meeting uh, through August. So um, I don't think we're going to meet very much in June or July. Uh, we're letting some so-called dust settle and and then we'll be back to pass budgets and such in august so it could be later this year and i'm much to report right now now you can volunteer me if you want to <laughs> um bridget the one the one area that might be i don't know how much information we'll have but i think restarting school um yes it, it may be premature but i think um I think all of the issues that are going to come up in terms of restarting uh, would be uh, helpful to publicize. I just don't know the right timing on that. Yeah, it's a little bit tricky because if we're expecting to be on our regular schedule and back to some sense of normalcy, that article would need to be handed in toward the end of July to run in the early August issue in order to give people enough of a heads up about that. Yeah. Um, I mean, we could we could put that down tentatively and then maybe change it at a future board meeting as things become clearer and put Martin down perhaps for a legislative update um, that would be due at the end of August and um, would come out in early September if that fits. Yeah, I think, um, and I think the other area, Bridget, that may be of help uh, or uh, supportive um, and I, again, not knowing specific timing and some of this may, de may be dependent. Well, I know it's dependent on a lot of variables, but um, there's, there's a fair amount that's coming out in efforts to sort of define the impact on the general ed fund of COVID-19. Um, and then there's the element of the, what the, what's the impact of those shortfalls and the longer term ramifications. So um, it, it's one of those areas that I think um, the community would have great interest in. It's just a case of at what point in time are there answers versus questions, uh, for instance. Yeah. So I would certainly sign up for that at the appropriate time. Um, and maybe we can just put it as a placeholder for right now. Okay. Well, and I almost hate to bring it up, but at some point, we're going to have to talk about master planning and school reconstruction or building or, you know, I don't know when there's going to be bandwidth and desire for that, but we got to do it sometime. Yeah, we'll have to talk about it, but I think we need to restart the process before we start planning an article about it. Um, so for now, that's mostly um, on the back burner and for sure we'll have to, we'll have to add that back into our agenda and, and talk about it some more soon but i think in terms of articles for the other paper um we've probably got it looks like we've got about five months or so of articles um potentially in the queue and master planning comes after that or at whatever point we, we really get going in thanks for that suggestion brian no Delana, right on, did you get on. all those as we talked about them or do you need me to send you an email yeah Okay. Yeah, an email would be good if uh, just okay. to make sure we captured what you want would be good. Thanks. Okay, I will do that after we wrap up. Um, so item agenda item number 13, um, set the agenda for the May 6th, um, 2020 meeting. 
So next Wednesday, we are back uh, again. Um, and this meeting is usually held a little later because of spring break. So we usually have the schedule of, of one week between the two meetings. Um, one thing I was hoping we could add to that May 6th agenda was an enrollment update, um, just where we are with kindergarten um, and, and some of the other enrollments um, for next year. No problem. We'll put it under a superintendent's report. Okay. Are there other suggestions from the board? We should probably have an update of anything. I guess it would fall under COVID-19, but any update about voting, if there are any changes or anything based on what we've heard from Montpelier in the in the meantime. I'm assuming there'll be nothing, but uh, we just might want to make note of that in the COVID-19 update under your report too. Yep, no problem. I think we can probably take end of the school year off for this one since we're just doing it tonight and we can, we'll still keep 180 on there if there's any Thing different. The noise is probably good to just if there's any update, COVID enrollment update and update on voting. And David, could I, um, I think COVID needs to be expanded to include not only some of the topics you've covered, but also, um, you know, the, the CARES funding, some legislative activity, um, some, some of the ed fund updates um, and some, maybe some of the, um, uh, governor's uh, emergency authority, things like that, as it comes up. So, there's a number we'll topic just put a, so we'll put a sub bullet underneath COVID maybe and do CARES funding. Um, well, I, I would just sort of say e economic, um, yeah. you know, uh, legislative and, and uh, it, there may be some buckets that may fall under there uh, that might make more sense, but it's, it's more than uh, just the, yeah, got yeah. it, which we, mm -hmm. Okay. Any other additions or changes to the May 6th agenda? Okay. Seeing none, we'll move along um, to um, uh, item number 14, future agenda items. I haven't done anything again on this. Um, my intent was to start knocking some of these out and I'll, again, we've got some of those that are on monitoring uh, reports, but I'm gonna try to take off some of those and just put a separate um, kind of Q and A back to the board to get some of those off. Okay. Okay. Um, agenda item number 15, consider the minutes of the meetings of March 25th, April 1st, April 6th, April 9th, and April 13th, 2020. Um, so we can just take those in, um, we take them in reverse order or, you know what? Yeah, it would be helpful if we could take them in reverse order since that's how they're in our packets. Um, and. Um, that would mean Monday, April 13th, um, was a special meeting um, to discuss the budget. Were there any changes to those meeting minutes from anyone? Okay, seeing none, those are approved. Um, April 9th um, was an 8 a.m. Um, special meeting of the school board um, to discuss negotiations. Um, any changes to those minutes? Nope. Um, April 6th was a special meeting of the school board um, at 6 p.m. Um, to discuss the budget. Did anyone have any changes to those minutes? Okay. Um, those are approved as well. Um, April 1st um, was a regular meeting of the school board. Um, and did anyone have any changes to those minutes? <coughs> no. Okay, and finally, uh, Wednesday, March 25th was a special meeting of the school board. Does anyone have any changes to those minutes? Okay, so no changes. Those minutes are all approved. We we'll moved on to item number 16, the consent agenda. Um, and David, do you want to highlight yep. these two? Sure. 
So uh, you have two items on here, two, two individuals, I should say. Uh, Deb Bennett, who has been a, a longtime special educator. Um, she's obviously, um, um, we've got her under the retirement resigning uh, component. Um, and then there's a leave of abs absence. And again, I have said not recommended. And um, I do want to clarify that for the board. Um, again, uh, this is Megan Downing. Uh, she's been a, a teacher um, at Rick Marcotte. Uh, she's doing a wonderful job, and she went on uh, requested leave of absence, unpaid, uh, for this current school year, um, and she has been uh, doing uh, some teaching in Rome and expanding her her teaching um, and learning, and it has been a great experience for her. She's asking for another year. I have no doubt that she has been outstanding and has benefited uh, greatly. Uh, she's asking for a second year and for me uh, this is always a hard decision but it's one that i need to balance past requests and future requests and look at the efficacy associated with students uh, in our district um, i have not um, granted uh, second years i think it's been important to be able to offer an experience like that but when we don't um, when we hold open a position, it does make it difficult for the school, the school school leadership, and the ability to, to meet the needs of, of students. So I'm very supportive of, of the professional development opportunity for a year. Um, again, it's unpaid, um, but if it goes to another year, then again, I have to hold open a position and it does um, change the, the opportunities uh, to continue to move that school forward. Again, as I said earlier, uh, we've had many past uh, staff members who benefited from a year. Some have asked for a second and I've been consistent in saying no. And so it's with a heavy heart that I do recommend, I do not recommend this. Um, but again, you did receive her letter and I'm certainly happy to respond to any questions that you might have um, related to, to Megan. So what would happen, um, what would be the next steps if we did not approve her uh, leave of absence? Would there be a hiring process to fill her role permanently? Um, how would all of that work? Well, she would, she would, again, depending upon all of the scenarios associated with, with contracts, um, once contracts go out, if she's on that, she would get a contract uh, and she would have uh, the appropriate number of days to respond uh, whether she is wanting to return or not. If she chooses to not return, she would obviously not sign her contract and we would have an open position um, that would be uh, looked upon as a, as a permanent position, not as a one-year only position. And so that would be the pathway. If obviously she signs the contract, then uh, she's made a decision to return. So those are, those are, uh, those are the options um, currently that I see for her at this moment. And Elizabeth or David, I'm not sure who's the right person to answer this question. Um, if we choose not to approve something that's on the consent agenda, how do we do that? It's best that you, I think, take it off and just take an action, uh, action on it and uh, just have a have a, um, just take a vote to approve or not approve. Okay. So, so, so if we just leave it on the consent agenda, we're not approving the recommendation. Correct. If we, if we want to potentially not Change agree it. with that recommendation, then we would have to take it off. That's right. Okay. That was confusing to me. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. Because it's, I, I put it on here under the consent agenda and it's clearly marked not recommended. So, um, if you would, if you are good with the consent agenda, but I'm, I'm not wanting to make your decision. I'm, I just wanted to highlight that for you. Yeah, um, Bridget and, and other fellow board members, the way that the consent agenda has worked in the past, this is the administrative recommendation. So it's, it's really, it doesn't require action, but in the past, if there's been questions about a specific recommendation and we want to defer action or defer um, any, deci any decision on the administrative recommendation, we might take it off the okay. consent agenda and move it to a future agenda with clarifying information or requests for that uh, additional info. 
Okay. Yeah, I have to just say this one is a really hard one for me um, personally because uh, Megan was uh, my older son's teacher last year and um, she has done a great job of keeping in touch. She even had a Zoom call with a little reunion call with that class mm -hmm. uh, a week ago. Um, and I know that she still feels very strongly tied to our school community. Um, however, I do understand the issue of precedent and the issue of needing to uh, give administrators, especially a new administrator who's coming into the school, clarity about um, who will be on the team next year and, and in following years. Um, so I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts um, before we move on. Okay, okay. seeing none, uh, the consent agenda then is approved. Um, item number 17 on the agenda, accounts payable order 36, 37, and 38. Were there any questions about any of those? Seeing none, uh, we'll move on to agenda item number 18, accounts payable order check to Howard Center in the amount of $73,070.22. Is there any further discussion about this from Amity or Gary or anyone? No? Okay. I, I do have a question on this, Bridget. I, yes. I'm curious because we do um, contract for a number of services through organizations like the Howard Center, how is the Howard Center delivering service during the pandemic? There, well, this is for February, but that, that's like a good that. question now. But yes, this one is for February, but yes. It's an so interesting question. you definitely will see some curtailing uh, on the services, although some um, are doing similarly to what what our teachers and staff are doing um, for students and whom they support. So um, that that said, I think you'll see a little curtailment um, in this particular area on a going forward basis. Does that, David, for clarification, if those services may be part of an IEP, does it really defer the need to deliver those services at a later point when they're available? Or is it a curtailment for this particular school year? Depending again on um, the IEP, Elizabeth, and mm -hmm. um, because we are in a different mode right now of providing uh, instruction um, to students, then mm -hmm. we are required to meet the IEP requirements. Right. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's hard to answer it in you know, a global response because it, it, it does depend upon the IEP or the IEPs in which we're okay. serving. So, uh, I again, I, I'm happy to give a little bit more of a more detailed update if you wish um, and have Joanne do a little bit of that specific to the Howard Center and other agencies might be good for you to know a little bit more about how we're how we're moving through that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I, I think that would be helpful, I think. Do I have a motion to approve the accounts payable check uh, to Howard Center? So moved. Do I have a second? I have a second from Brian. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, that check is approved. Um, do I, uh, any other thoughts? I know the last couple of meetings, there have been a couple of things that people wanted to add right before the end. No? Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to uh, highlight about the, the, the warning. Normally, if we were all present, we would get signatures. <laughs> so I know Delina is going to, um, she's wanting to make sure we get uh, signatures. I'd love to be able to get them in person, um, although we, I can certainly scan them to you tomorrow. But I don't know, for those of you that can swing by, use your key entrance, you can put your mask on, you can come into our office, our doors open, you can um, physically distance, you can, we'll have the, the warning ready to sign where you can sign, bring your own pen or we'll have extra pens there. You can take it and, and leave. Um, that would be helpful. So I, I don't know. And I'm certainly happy to scan to any of you that can't. And if you have a access to a scanner, sign and scan back. Donna did indicate to me that that was fine. Scanning 
you know, signatures that are scanned are, are also accepted, she's indicated to me. So I don't know what your pleasure is um, around how you wish me to do this. Um, so D David, if you could scan it to me, because I'm going to be in Zoom meetings all day, so. Okay. Yeah, if you could scan it to me, David, also. Okay. I will stop in. Um, taking a break from homeschooling is <laughs> most welcome. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I'll, be happy to swing, I'll be happy to swing in too, David. This is Brian. And Brian. <laughs> I'll, I'll come in. I will come in. Yeah, so, so I don't, it would be great if maybe uh, Bridget, Alex, and Brian, if you could swing in. And I'll kind of wait for the three of you to sign before I then send it off for um, Elizabeth and Martin. Um, I'll try to do it so you can we can get a complete page signed um, without having to do it in multiple ones. Great. Okay, thanks, Bridget. Thank you. Um, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. And I second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> Sorry, my internet connection is unstable. So all in favor? Aye. I think we are adjourned. Thank you, Thank everyone. You, everybody. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody.